You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to measure the wavelength of light using an interferometer. Hey kiddos, welcome back to the show. So today's episode is a little bit of a short thing, because I'm trying to work on a few other things right now. Now, if you haven't already seen the video I made on constructing a Mickelson interferometer, I go through a lot more details of what's actually happening. So hold your horses, and go ahead and watch that video. Well, if you are still here and you haven't seen that one yet, regardless, the essentials you need to know for this video is that by changing the distance of one of the paths, effectively we introduce a phase difference, which means the light coming out on the ends will have a different either constructive or deconstructive interference pattern. Which means if we're using a light of frequency f and we're seeing a dark spot, then if we move it by the distance prescribed by this formula here, we'll see it shift over to a bright spot. In other words, we're shifting from completely deconstructive to constructive interference. So with that said, let's go ahead and look at the actual experiment, which I recorded like two months ago. Again, this whole setup is extremely similar to the one that we used in the interferometer video. There are a few changes, however. For instance, on this mirror down here, you can see I've added this little micrometer mount. What that allows me to do is move this mirror ever so slightly, translating it back and forth uh, further away from the beam splitter and closer to the beam splitter, so that hopefully, by changing that distance, we can see slight variations in the output interference pattern. As before, this device here is extremely sensitive. In fact, it only takes a change of one half of a wavelength to go from a bright fringe to a dark fringe. Even a slight push down on this metal base creates many fringe shifts in the output pattern. So if you're trying to do this, you're gonna have to have some pretty steady hands. There's just one other difference that I've added into this device, or rather, taken away. In the previous interferometer, I had a telescoping lens set up here. So effectively, we would expand the beam, it would contract down, it would go into this other lens, and then it would become collimated, and we'd have a wider beam, so it'd be easier to see the pattern. However, this time, I've left in only one of the lenses, and that's because I like the spherical aberration patterns. Now this next part's gonna be relatively simple. I have the micrometer currently set to be 4.20 millimeters, and I'm going to rotate it till I get to 4.30 millimeters. And while I do that, we simply have to pick a spot on this interference pattern, so whether it be the inner ring, the second ring, or the first ring, rather, the second ring, the third ring, or so on, and we simply have to watch how many times that goes from bright to dark. This would be quite hard in person. However, due to the magic of editing in slow motion, we should be able to count it up. Now there are a few things to keep in mind here before we proceed. We measured the distance that we moved this mirror off in that direction. However, that's only half the distance light has to travel, since it has to go there and back. Now due to this doubling of the distance, that means every time we moved the micrometer wheel by one half the wavelength, we would get a full bright to bright fringe shift. From our measurement, we know this big N here, which is the number of times it went from bright to bright. So thus, we know that big N times lambda has to be equal to two times this distance. In other words, lambda, the wavelength of the light, is equal to two times the distance we measured divided by the number of fringes n. So that means we got our formula. Now the laser that we're using is claimed to be a 532 nanometer laser. However, it's like a $3 laser pointer mounted inside this block, so who knows what it actually is, but it's probably pretty close to there. And plugging in the values we got from our measurement, we calculated this wavelength here which is pretty close, actually. To really put the accuracy of this measurement to the test, I have a helium-neon laser, which has a very well-known wavelength of 632.8 nanometers. So let's see how it does. Just as before, I'm going to turn the micrometer 0 0.10 millimeters. Now using the same formula as before, this is the measured wavelength of our laser, and this is the actual wavelength. So you can see they're actually decently close, like definitely enough for the experimental error of these hands. If you're trying to do this yourself, here are some tips for you. First off, slow motion video capture can be so useful. If you don't have a fancy camera like I do, you can always use your iPhone or something like that, and that should work just fine. The second piece of advice I would have, 
is to do your measurement over many fringes because that makes the relative error from you trying to read your micrometer with high precision go down overall. So your measurement at the end will be much more true to what it actually is. Thank you all so much for watching the video. Even if it was a really short one, I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it. And if you want to see content like this every week, then go ahead and hit the subscribe button below. If social media is your cup of decaffeinated tea, then you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram, which I'm trying to post regularly to so that I can kind of update you guys with just random things going on. Furthermore, if you have any video suggestions that you'd like to see, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below. So that's all for this week. Please remember to be safe and have a wonderful day. I'll see you guys next time. You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to build a plasma chandelier.